welcome everyone who is online and for those of you who are joining us uh, for the recording, welcome wherever you are and whenever you are to this QLock webinar. And today we're um, going to hear from two of our professional development scholarship winners uh, who went to VALA 2018. So for those of you um, on the webinar, I would like to remind you that QLock offers excellent scholarships for professional development. Um, all QLock member library staff can apply. And um, there's a selection panel of the university librarians that get together to review those applications. Um, I'll put in a plug that the next round of scholarships uh, application will be in October this year. So if you're inspired by our speakers today, please think about um, nominating a professional development activity for yourself to go to and um, also share the experiences. And we're really pleased to have Kylie and Rachel with us today to do just that. So we're going to ask Kylie uh, to speak for about 10 minutes, then Rachel for another 10 minutes. And so there's plenty of time for interaction and questions. So um, I'm going to hand over to Kylie Poulton from Griffith University um, to give her perspective on VALA 2018. Thanks, Kylie. Thank you, Sue. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I hope everybody can see that okay. Um, uh, so for those of you out there who don't know me, I'm Kylie Poulton and I'm the business librarian at Griffith University at the Nathan campus. So my professional development activity was conducting a research project on text and data mining. And so as a part of my research, I investigated um, text and data mining tools, um, or TDM, which uh, TDM is the acronym um, that uh, is commonly used for text and data mining. Um, so I investigated TDM tools and methods, licensing and copyright implications, and how librarians currently are and how they can support TDM. Um, also, as a part of my research, I devised a conceptual framework for how libraries can leverage from ex ex existing service strengths to support TDM research. So the aim of this was to write the paper for VALA 2018, and uh, that paper was accepted, and I delivered it at the conference in February this year. So what I thought I would do is uh, just take you through some of the um, uh, just give you a brief overview of my presentation and then I will talk about my key takeaways. And it doesn't seem like my, oh, here we go. Okay. So um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was it stemmed out of a personal interest. So I really like data journalism and I love reading the um, data stories and analysis that you see more and more on uh, like the front of Guardian and the ABC. Um, and I noticed that um, academic research was, was starting to use uh, this, uh, these techniques. Um, and this is an example here that uh, was in the conversation and they got reported in the wider media. And it's just a really simple textual analysis of a news corpus. So I thought as librarians, we are the gatekeepers to um, all, you know, uh, vast amounts of uh, information and resources and um, and I thought well this is a whole new source of data for our researchers to access uh, using new research uh, me methods um, like TDM so uh, so the, the scholarship the PD scholarship gave me a great opportunity to explore something that I was really interested in and it allowed me to filter the knowledge that I gained through doing the research and the ideas that I came, that I came up with um, into something that could be introduced into library practice. So in my uh, presentation, Oops, sorry. In my presentation, I argued that there were two reasons why librarians should care about supporting TDM. So the first uh, argument was that we spend tremendous amounts of money on uh, purchasing access to resources, and that's predominantly um, electronic resources. Um, and considering all that money that we pay for this access, we should be able to assume that our users could access that to mine um, using computational techniques, but that turned out not to be the case. And the other, the other thing that I argued 
with that we should be viewing our collections as data. Um, and as it turned out at uh, Vala, the collection as data turned out to be a bit of a buzz phrase, especially in the glam sector. So I was really glad that I was able to uh, plug into that idea as well. But whether you're uh, in the glam sector or in an academic library, I still think that um, our collect if we view our collections as data, um, our researchers should be able to mine, visualize, map and analyze um, our collections um, using computa computational techniques. Sorry, I keep going backwards. So this is a conceptual model that I developed uh, based around basic uh, steps in a TDM research methodology. And I examined how support services that are commonly found in academic libraries could support TDM. And I also placed this into the bigger context of data management and open scholarship, because without those two things, uh, you, um, it's very difficult to conduct TDM research. And then I concluded uh, by talking about how librarians might overcome the skills gap uh, that we may have and how we can specifically support TDM. And there I am up on the stage at VALA. So another professional development tip for me is when you go to a conference, don't assume like I did that you'll be speaking in one of those nice quiet side rooms, um, you know, that are quite small. No, I got to speak on the main stage. So that was a bit of a shock, but anyway, it happened and I got through. Okay, so, um, so first of all, some of the key professional takeaways from, um, from this professional development experience was that I learned that having the opportunity to conduct practitioner research is a great way to underpin strategic and operational directions in libraries. And by immersing in the current literature and knowledge and focusing on and developing ideas, concepts and frameworks, librarians can create services based on best practice and evidence. And it also gave me the opportunity to explore how libraries uh, and services such as in research can interact and collaborate to develop new and innovative services. Um, key personal takeaways. Some of the things that I learned personally was how to conduct and write a literature review. So in my work with researchers, I'm always talking to them about literature reviews, but this was a matter of putting theory into practice. <clears throat> and I found that it's helped me enormously uh, when I'm working with HDR candidates and talking to them about literature reviews. Um, I've written a journal article and a conference paper before, but this was my first solo effort. So I learned a lot more about researching, writing and structuring a paper. I also learned about dealing with peer reviewer feedback. And um, I got more experience presenting at conferences because I was all by myself on this one. Um, I also got the opportunity to do to be a peer reviewer for, for a Vala paper. And so that was a great experience. And I've subsequently done more peer reviewing after that. Uh, in terms of applications in my work, um, an immediate impact were the skills and knowledge that I developed during this research project because it's enabled me to better support my HDR candidates. So I have noticed amongst the HDRs that I support, and I work with social scientists, that many are now starting to use TDM related techniques in their research methods. For example, they might be doing web scraping or social media scraping and sentiment analysis and things like that. So I'm able to engage with them on these topics, advise them on tools and methods, and I could refer them to other support services where they will need to learn those very specialized skills that they need. In terms of applications for uh, my library, I think um, uh, my research and then conceptual framework that I develop can help my library design uh, support services, not only for TDM, but for related digital scholarship services as well. And having the knowledge that I gained through this research project has certainly helped um, when I was recently involved in reviewing our research services. <clears throat> and in terms of uh, broader terms, uh, application for QLOC, one of the issues that I discovered in my research was uh, there's legal uncertainty that researchers in Australia face when they want to conduct TDM research. So at present, they need to rely on licensing conditions imposed by publishers. So I think QLOC can be a leader in the discussions and campaigning for fair dealing, for fair dealing exceptions for TDM. 
So just to finish up, um, if you've got a passion for something that's related to your library work and you want to explore it more, you want to have the opportunity to do this, then um, maybe uh, applying and receiving one of these professional development scholarships is a great way to, um, to start and get the opportunity to do that. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie. That was a great summary and um, well done on uh, presenting on the big stage. <laughs> now, um, we're going to move on to Rachel's presentation now and um, then hopefully um, all of the people on the webinar are getting their questions uh, ready for after that. So uh, I'd like to introduce Rachel Peat, Faculty Librarian here at the lovely Bond University Library. Hi everyone, I'm just going to work out how to share this screen for a few moments. Alright. I was hoping to turn the camera off, but anyway, here goes. Um, okay, so first of all, um, this is my first attendance at um, Viola 2018 as an early career librarian. I'd like to express my gratitude to QLOC and for granting the scholarship and for Bond University for supporting my attendance. Um, all in all, it was an action-packed week um, with inspiring keynote speakers, exhibitors, e-posters, networking, opportunities galore. Um, it offered lots of opportunities to learn about the future of the industry and what exciting innovations libraries are implementing around the globe. Note to self and anyone else that goes to a conference, um, provide better clarification around your notes. I used Evernote and I was taking photos on my iPad and there's some pretty, pretty blurry things happening there. Um, okay, so probably one of the key things that I, I heard I was absolutely terrified by was um, in next uh, 10 to 15 years, around 40% of the workforce face the high probability of being replaced by computers. So I guess the key thing is there, what are we going to be doing about that? So I'm going to give you a bit of a cookbooks tour around Vala and I'll put a link to my informal presentation at the end if anyone wants to have a little look at that. Um, okay. So key professional takeaways. Um, so David Key Lee King reminds us that our job is to make connections and not to lose our human connection. And if we're going to take a self-serve option, look at where we can connect with people. So at their particular library, he talks about libraries having traditional forms of content that are more cutting edge side of things. So there they've introduced the self-check and tiered serves, but they have people roving around, which isn't new to us, but they're changing their content. So, you know, it's a public library, got things like ukuleles and guitars, electronic device measurement and um, basically checking out things to create other things. Um, we talked about recording hubs um, where you can make an album or share your creation with the world or with your grandpa. Um, he can record his oral history. They have cake tins that you can loan and let's face it who really needs a Spiderman cake tin um, for more than one year um, unless you're like my child who dressed as Spiderman for two years of his life and that case you need it for more than two years. Um, they have vegetable seed loans, um, but people still want books and the content is changing. We need to think about the content in different ways. Um, other notable things was digital preservation. Uh, they were talking in the University of Melbourne um, that, universe, that it isn't a project or workflow, it's a new lifestyle we must adopt by necessity. So Uni of Melbourne is investigating projects for long-term data creation, looking at their preservation strategy from 2015 to 25, and they're looking at how to access digital materials um, in the next 50 years, like into the future. So it doesn't cease to amaze me how resourceful and innovative we are in library land, um, and it's a new lifestyle that we must adopt, as I said, by necessity. So, Elise Edmonds from the State Library of New South Wales talked about crowdsourcing and so that's using people power to do some really amazing things um, and they actually transcribed World War One diaries and I just thought that was amazing what they'd done there so that it was a whole crowdsourcing actual project um, and she said here once the diaries began to be transcribed significant items identified unique voices began to, themselves to be heard the diaries reflect the diversity of those who serve, laconic, humorous, and filled with description of adventures in Cairo and London. Um, and, you know, it just goes on. It's so good. But they write about homesickness, some of the horrors of war and conditions in the trenches, and some are more prosaic and write about their horse and what they cook for breakfast. 
So it'd be amazing to be part of something like that. I thought that was really cool. And there's other lots of uh, lots of other ones. There were like Joseph Banks term Scribathon, um, where people could come in and actually do that. So I, I think it'd be amazing to be part of something like that. Um, key personal takeaways. Um, so I'll just go on to that bit there. So Rose Holly was the winner of the Robert D. Williamson Award. Um, and you know, you've probably all heard of her for the amazing things that she, she has done with Trove. Um, but his wife, Mrs. Williamson, got up and presented the award to Rose. And this really struck me. Um, her, the quote was, everyone in his or her lifetime needs to put back into the community or the workshop or the home more than what they take out. Otherwise we would have a bankrupt society. And that really spoke to me. And I think particularly what stood out from the conference is that libraries have always given back. And now we're using technologies to give back on a global level through digital humanities projects like the ones I've mentioned. from using robots to teach digital literacy in disadvantaged communities, um, using virtual reality like Sarah Howard has from QUT with her uh, colleagues using virtual reality, transforming teaching. Um, and providing opportunities to engage with students. And of course, Kylie Poulton from Griffith, who is doing amazing things with data mining, I will never expect to understand. Um, so, day-to-day -day work, how is this going to impact me? So, one bit that I was going to mention, and I've lost my little note here, um, is talking about the e-books. Um, Sorry, I just lost my notes here. So there was a really interesting presentation about e-books um, and Edith Cowan uh, looking at print versus digital preferences of universities in Australia. Um, and as we all know, as space becomes a commodity, students prefer more and more study spaces reducing print. So they have conducted a very big survey concerning this. Um, so they've looked at the reading preferences and behaviours of university students. Um, ECU uh, and have a strong preference for reading in print due to eye strain, tactile features, better focus, and ability to highlight and take notes. And they appreciate the accessibility of the ebook, but they still prefer print. So, based on that, there was another global scale uh, survey done that looked at over in 21 countries, over 10,000 students have indicated the most students acknowledge that print works best for learning and they still prefer reading their academic text in pr print format. So I guess the key questions that have come out of that is what we're going to do to assist, because as we know, we are going to equal preferred. So are we looking at things like, will training improve usability and satisfaction and do students know how to use it or do they even want to? And this is the key questions she's actually put to us um, from Edith Cowan. It, um, is it our job to make students job ready with digital capability of using inversion and knowing about digital resources and how to use them? And something interesting I thought was loan periods, should they be the same as a physical ebook? Another thing that I've got out of the day-to-day -day work was Catherine Greenhill was talking about when we're doing projects that we don't always know what to do with failure. So, you know, we get to the end and go, oh no, you know, we didn't do this so well, what are we going to do now? But she suggests wait, don't wait until the end, evaluate what we're doing in the middle and then adjust as necessary before we go charging ahead. So I think that's a really good tip. Um, applications in my library. So um, I had lots of fun going around to all the different vendors, but I went and had a chat with a very friendly Belinda rep, rep there. Um, and I came home, home armed with the idea of approaching Gold Coast Council regarding a collaboration with them. And so my manager, Sue Hutley, introduced me to Amy Warduck from Gold Coast Council. And they're actually coming to the union in a couple of weeks. And they're going to be using Belinda with our second language students. Um, and, you know, they can join up the library that day and actually come away with some English language resources. So it's using our students and their resources. So I'm sure a few more things will pop up um, in the future that from attending Bala, um, but watch this space. Um, and uh, all I was going to say with applications in QLOC, um, as I mentioned, print first digital preferences of uni students. Um, so suggestions by that towards QLOC could be training to improve ebook usability for us. And, you know, I guess calling out to who else is doing that and showcasing it and to lobby publishers to develop more user-friendly features and platforms. That might be a call initiative, but um, that certainly could be ours as well. So I found that very interesting. Um, and so I'll just put a link to my informal report back and um, it's not me talking, so I won't be as nervous. Um, and there's lots of cool pictures, so uh, feel free to have a look at that. And thanks for listening. 
Okay. Well, thank you to Rachel and to Kylie. I'm going to just figure out. Hmm. Stop sharing. There we go. I think we're back. Um, so for the um, participants on today, uh, we'd love it if you would like to type us a chat message with a question. Um, and so I should have preempted that to uh, get you to start doing that. But in the meantime, what I'm going to do is ask Kylie to turn back on her microphone and um, just give us her insights and then over to Rachel, just about, I guess, the other things that happened at Bala and whether there was any other sessions um, that were memorable um, for you, Kylie. Um, uh, let me think, there, uh, there, there was a very memorable, se memorable session, but unfortunately I cannot remember um, the name of that. Um, oh, I know who was very memorable, and um, I'm sure Rachel would agree. Um, it was Professor Deb Verhoeven's um, closing um, keynote, which was pretty amazing. She had all the librarians in the room singing. Um, I have got some video of that of that. Um, Anybody would like to see it. Um, so her talk was uh, very inspirational. Um, one of the um, the interesting things that she spoke about was the fair principles of uh, the fair data principles, and how uh, she thought that they need to be extended, and she thought that there needed to be an E and an R on the end, so they should be fairer. But I'm, I'm struggling to remember what the um, what the E R. I think the E was ethical, and the R. Um, I don't know if Rachel can remember what the R was, but I thought that was quite, um, if you go in and check out her speech, it'll be in there. But I thought um, that one was a particular stand out for me. Um, oh, and I just remember the other one, it was Angela Gavin from Brown University um, in the US. Um, her keynote was exceptional as well. Uh, she didn't hold her punches when she was talking about publishers. Um, so some of the uh, things she said, maybe considered a little bit controversial. Um, but if, um, if you've got, if you've just got limited time, those two are ones that I would probably dip into um, because all the, all the Bala um, presentations are all available online on their site. Recorded in papers, I think, too. Any more that we can think of? Um, I, there was just lots of digital humanities projects. There was an amazing one with, um, Matt Miller from Pratt's Institute of School of Information where they have this program called um, project called Link Jazz and so it's all um, in your New Orleans um, there's all local history performers um, and they've got all their music and it's about civic engagement um, and it's you know one database and they're also doing the Nuremberg trials so um, I've got a link to that uh, in my actual sways for that so that's just an open access initiative so I think digital humanities is just really taking off that really stood out to me for the conference. Um, and uh, again for you both, uh, any um, tips for people about the Vala Trade Exhibition which is usually very extensive? I don't know if you want to say anything about that Rachel. Um, no, um, yes I went around and said hello to everyone. I suppose meeting with the Belinda rep was really good for me. Um, but just yeah, it was nice going around chatting to people and saying hello and getting a free pen. Yeah, it's, um, it is a pretty good trade exhibition actually. So uh, lots going on and um, the food was pretty good this year too, can I just say? Oh, it normally is. And any other hands-on things? Um, oh, I, I remember the digital, or... the digital poster presentations were excellent. Um, I really enjoyed them got lost the first time and I, I did miss the one I wanted to see. Um, but uh, it's, um, if you, you know, you can grab your lunch 
and then they've scheduled talks near the posters so you can grab your lunch and go and hear a poster presentation and they're all on big digital screens and they're all beautifully presented um, and so I really I really enjoyed that. I went and spoke to the little um, humanoid robot um, Neo and I got him I filmed him doing Tai Chi. <laughs> That's, that's good. That was an experience. Yeah. Um, well, Carly Claire Thorpe from USQ does have a question for you today, and it was, um, why did you choose Bala um, as the conference to present your findings, or, you know, um, and was there other places that you were thinking about either presenting this or writing it, and um, how did it turn out that it would be Bala? Well, um, I think... I guess the first reason I chose Fala was because in my mind, it was a very high profile conference um, to attend. Um, and also because it, uh, it had its normal, well, it, it asked for papers about, you know, technology uh, and technology related um, uh, things for libraries. So I thought that it would be a really good fit for Vala. Um, my, uh, because I have, um, uh, with my colleague, Julie Tui, uh, we did submit an abstract to Vala, the previous Vala, and we, we actually got rejected from that. And so I wasn't sure if I was going to make it in this time. Um, and so I, my, uh, my plan was if I didn't make Vala, I would uh, maybe try for the e-research conference, but I um, I was lucky to, to get into Vala. And um, the other positive is that was in Melbourne, so I got to go down there. <laughs> yes, all good things. And a sub-question to that, um, how did your experience um, of the conference differ being a speaker rather than just an attendee? That's a really good question. Uh, yeah, it is a lot different. Um, I guess you're in a totally different headspace. Um, I, uh, the last conference I spoke at, it was the Alia one with Julie Dewey and uh, we were the last session on the last day. So we had to spend the entire three days worrying about a presentation. So this was a little bit easier because I was on the second day. Um, and I guess until you, um, until you get over your presentation, you can't really escape the nerves of it. Um, but one of the advantages is you, um, maybe because you're in the presenter's room, you sort of um, meet other speakers, got to meet some of the keynote speakers. Um, Angela Gavin that I was talking about before, she was in there because she was speaking on the same day. So you have those opportunities. Um, and uh, it just, uh, because you're speaking, I had people come up to me and just started talking to me because they had seen my presentation and then they wanted to chat to me about it. Uh, so that is another really great advantage um, of being a speaker. Uh, if anybody's nervous about it, um, you know, I know I showed you up there on the on the big stage and it was a bit scary. It really is okay. Um, you get a lot of support. You've got a lot of, you've got technical people there who are gonna help you get through it. Um, and I, um, I buddied up with my co-presenter because this was a session with two speakers. Uh, she found me on the first day. Another great uh, connection was made because she, um, she's right into digital scholarship and digital humanities down at the University of Newcastle. Um, and we sort of um, buddied up and we, we got through it and um, did our practicing and everything. So that's a, a really good advantage of being a speaker. Um, yeah, and uh, hanging around the speaker's room, that's a really good tip. You get yeah. very interesting yeah. people. Yeah. So, yes, for anyone, um, that's a great tip. Thank you, Kylie. Um, over to Rachel. Question for Rachel today is, what are some of your tips for the first time, for a first-timer at a big conference? Well, I think um, well, the technology just makes it so easy. They've got the Vala app, plug for Vala. Um, so you could go through and actually tick what ones you wanted to go to and it was all kind of mapped out for you. So, you know, you still had your little book that you carried around, but the app made it really handy. It was like a reminder that you had to go. 
um, wear flat shoes because where it was, we did lots of miles sort of up and down the actual exhibition centre. Um, I think probably the hardest thing is I'm, I like to think I'm an extrovert, but I might be an introvert. It is hard to sort of get out in the exhibition area and talk to, to people. Um, and I did find that hard, but I sort of pushed myself to go up and introduce myself and you have your badge so you kind of go up and who are you and where do you work? Um, and I think that's a benefit of going to something like that. You've just got to push past the nerves, I suppose, of doing that. Um, and just, yeah, talk to anyone that you can. I think that's the best tip. And, and I love being in Melbourne. I haven't been before, so it's pretty fab. Good. Yeah, excellent <laughs> tips. Excellent. I'm going to call for last questions today from anyone. Well... We're going to uh, let everyone go off for their afternoon cup of tea to reflect on and perhaps check up on their VALA presentations. Um, we'll also be making this um, obviously available, this presentation and the links to Rachel's way. Uh, we're obviously going to go out and check out Kylie's presentation and paper. We look forward to reading that. Um, I'd like to thank both of you very much for sharing your experiences, um, but also really just to be brave enough to apply for a scholarship um, and I guess make the time to um, undertake a presentation, do all of the reflections. Um, and I think probably both of you would say that it's absolutely worth it. So Yes, absolutely. So thank you very much um, to the both of you. Thanks for those of you who have joined us today. A special thanks for Rachel Harrison, our QLOC Executive Officer, for all of her background work, which she does effortlessly. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, to the University Librarians Committee who support these scholarships, we also say thank you to them and the Selection Committee. And um, we look forward to more of these webinars. We've got another one in June uh, for our other scholarship winners. So please join us um, for those webinars and more details on the QLOC site. So have a great afternoon, everyone. And um, we look forward to hearing about your conference experiences wherever they may be. Bye, everyone. Bye.